Hi everyone. I hope you're doing well today. We're coming near the end of this series. We're on session 11 of COVID-19 Colorado Beyond. Our webinar sponsored by the University of Colorado Denver's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and its continuing and professional education and interdisciplinary studies programs. I'm Marjorie Levine Clark, and I'm a professor of history and associate dean for diversity outreach and initiatives in the college, and I'm moderating this series. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to ask questions during the lecture, and we hope to get to as many of the questions we have at the end of the presentation. Information about student credit and continuing education units can be found on our continuing and professional education website. Students interested in credit have to write a one-page paper for every lecture, and today we have two lectures, so we have two prompts. Let me take a sip of water. Students, you can choose which prompt you want to write on. And the first prompt is, describe the basic premise of statistics, including the terms population, sample, and inference. Describe and provide an example about how this basic premise of statistics can be used to understand generalizability and cause and effect in COVID-19 studies and news articles. And I'll read that again, so if you're thinking it during the lecture, it'll be helpful. Describe the basic premise of statistics, including the terms population, sample, and inference. Describe and provide an example about how this basic premise of statistics can be used to understand generalizability and cause and effect in COVID-19 studies and news articles. So that will be for the first lecture. The second prompt is, what are the key points of TWC? How does it compare to the SIR model besides one being data-driven and the other model rate of change driven? I'll read that one again too. What are the key points of TWC? How does it compare to the SIR model besides one being data-driven and the other model rate of change driven? And I'm sure these will both make sense when you hear the lecture. These prompts will also be posted on the course website along with all the other questions. The lectures are also being recorded and will be up on the website and the CLAS YouTube page. As usual, I'm going to thank many people who made this webinar happen. First, Dean Pam Jansma and Assistant Dean Joanne Porter of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for supporting this program and making credit available to many of our students at no cost. Our outstanding faculty who volunteered their time for this series, Mike Effler and Noah Dodero from the Office of Information Technology, Shana Bull, Amy Arnold, and the Office of Digital Education, Interim Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Joanne Brennan, the University Registrar, Carrie John and her team, Associate Bursar Eric Gray, and our big team from CLAS, Tracy Combe, Director of Marketing and Communication, Laurel Dodds, Director of Continuing and Professional Education, Course and Curriculum Coordinator, Mary Lovett, and Kristen Salisbury, Program Manager for Continuing and Professional Education, who oversaw putting the whole event together. As I mentioned, we have two separate lectures today, each about half an hour. Dr. Audrey Hendricks, our first presenter, is an Associate Professor of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences. She received her PhD in Biostatistics from Boston University. Her interests center around big data in the context of health and disease. She recently has been working on user-friendly software to increase the utility and equity of publicly available genetic data, especially for diverse populations. Professor Hendricks's presentation will be on statistics in the news in the time of COVID-19. Our second presenter is Dr. Weldon Lodwick, who is a professor in the Department of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences. He received his PhD from Oregon State University. He has worked on both intelligent geographic information systems and differential equations applied to dengue fever in Brazil, models of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the E. coli outbreak in Germany, 
as well as protein molecule conformation problems with the nucle Nuclear Magnetic Research Laboratory. The research he is presenting today was done in collaboration with Masood Asadi Zedabadi, who is an associate professor on clinical teaching track in the Department of Physics, and Francis Newman, who is an associate professor emeritus in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Professor Lodwick will present their mathematical and physics-based model that identifies the source and spread of disease in time and space. So let me welcome Professor Audrey Hendricks to start us off. Hi all, my name is Dr. Audrey Hendricks and I'm an Associate Professor of Statistics here at CU Denver. And I am happy to be here today to talk with you about statistics in the news in the time of COVID-19. So the use of statistics to make logical conclusions is everywhere. <clears throat> so we see have seen many headlines where we're using um, patients or, or people that were in a Diamond Princess cruise ship to better understand the spread of disease. We also have seen recent studies and news articles about potential treatments such as hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir. So first I want to start with what is statistics? Statistics is when we have some population of people. Maybe this is all the people in the world. And this population has some true unknowns. So for instance, um, there are some true unknowns about the spread of COVID-19 or how many people uh, will die from COVID-19 or how likely it is to become very, very sick and so on. We can't possibly study everybody in the world. And so instead we take a sample from a population <clears throat> and we do something to that sample. We summarize the sample, we analyze it, uh, we look into it in detail. But the real purpose of statistics is to try to make an inference or a logical conclusion back to this overall general population. An inference is a logical conclusion. And when we make this in statistics, we can even get an idea or quantify the uncertainty of our inference. Now, the way we collect our data is very, very important and will influence what kind of logical conclusions we can make about the population using our particular sample. So can we make a cause and effect conclusion? To whom can we generalize? from our statistical analysis. So I do want to just make the point here that this general framework of statistics is not, does not only hold true for statistics. Indeed, it holds true for data science. So in data science, we are also gathering information from a population, a smaller sample, doing something to that and trying to make a logical conclusion back and as well for machine learning. This is incredibly important to remember that whatever we are doing or trying to predict with machine learning, we need to be very aware of the population from which we sample and are doing our work. So I'm going to be talking about two major topics for uh, inference today for this logical conclusions, cause and effect and generalizability. And I wanna to start today with generalizability. So generalizability are to whom or what type of conclusions, uh, to whom do they apply? So we want to apply these logical conclusions. Who can we extend them to from our study? For instance, can we extend them to all people with COVID-19 in the world? Or only people that are hospitalized with COVID-19? How about, how does our generalizability from our current study vary by race or ethnicity or socioeconomic status or biological sex or adults and children? To whom can we generalize our results? And so we again see this quite often across the news, again in the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Can we extend the results from that one cruise ship to people not on cruise ships? And I'll talk later when I give more specific examples about this one down here, when we're looking at the prevalence and clinical presentation of healthcare workers from Dutch hospitals. 
So back to our general framework of statistics, where we have a population, we take a sample, we do some kind of analysis or summary, we make an inference or logical conclusion back to our population. But usually, we don't just want to go back to the population from which we sampled. Quite often, we want to generalize beyond the population from which we sampled. If we sampled just a cruise ship, I'd like to know whether uh, those results apply to people that aren't on a cruise ship, for instance. Now, when we do this, any of the, uh, the results that are, we are generalizing beyond the population from which we sampled are now outside the framework of statistics. And so we are going to need other logical evidence. We're going to have to make other assumptions to extend beyond the population from which we sampled to another population. And we should be very, very clear about what logic we're using to do this and what assumptions we need. And we often want to do this, right? But I want to generalize beyond the population from which I sampled. Again, it's not based on a statistical model, and we should be very clear with our logic or assumptions. And sometimes it's okay to generalize beyond the population from which we sampled. Uh, for instance, there was a study on how best to sharpen skates, and they took a sample of Canadian expert skaters. Well, we could probably generalize the results of that study to amateur skaters as well. That's probably an okay generalizability. Um, in addition, maybe we're looking and we see human-to-human -human transmission of COVID-19 in Europe and Asia. It's probably okay to generalize that we would also have human-to-human -human transmission in the US. Sometimes it's not okay. So for a long time in the 1990s and beforehand, clinical trials on heart disease were performed in white men. And so new medications that, were com that came out, uh, it was not necessarily okay to generalize that they would work well or work in the same way or the same dosage would be needed on women and different ethnicities or ancestries or races. And so um, sometimes it's not okay to generalize. In addition, if we were, and this is another example I'll talk about later, if we were to do a vaccine trial on only healthy young people, could we generalize that vaccine trial to people who are older or more at risk? So now I want to turn to the other side of inference or logical conclusions in statistics that I want to talk about, which is cause and effect. And so, for instance, uh, this is when we want to draw a cause and effect relationship between two variables traits, features, attributes. For instance, putting my hand on a hot stove caused me to feel pain. Exposure to COVID-19 caused me to get sick. There's two main types of studies I'm gonna talk about today, experimental studies and observational studies. Experimental studies are studies where we manipulate or change something. For instance, maybe I am going to manipulate or control who gets a vaccine or who gets a treatment. And then I'm going to do this because I want to try to cause an effect on another variable. For instance, COVID-19 diagnosis. If I control who gets the vaccine, do I see then that people who get a vaccine are less likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19? Within experimental studies, we have something called a randomized experiment. And this is where we assign study objects, people, randomly to treatment groups. So I'm going to randomly assign people to get a vaccine or to not get a vaccine, for instance. And randomized experiments, and specifically randomized clinical trials, for instance, for, for COVID-19 treatments or vaccines, uh, are very special. And from these, we can make causal conclusions from these types of studies. And this is partially because the randomization helps to mix up subjects with different features among the various treatment groups. Now, I like to say that funny things can happen with randomization, and it's true that even when we randomize, groups can have patterns. But, you know, when that happens, we can usually incorporate those variables and those patterns into our statistical analyses. So I want to quickly mention a side note on one of my favorite words that um, is really essential to randomized clinical trials. So this word is equipoise. An equipoise means an ethical balance. And an ethical balance is necessary for a randomized clinical trial. In other words, we need to be uncertain 
about whether a treatment or a vaccine is beneficial. So we have this balance as shown down here. Now, once we are outside of this balance, so once a treatment or vaccine has been proven to be beneficial, then it is actually unethical to keep the treatment or vaccine from people. And, in, and we must give the treatment and vaccine to all people on the study. On the other hand, once a treatment or vaccine has been proven not to be beneficial, then it is unethical to continue to give the treatment to people, and we must immediately stop giving the treatment and vaccine to all people. And we'll see this play out later when I give an example. So to summarize this section, a randomized clinical trial can be used to conclude that a vaccine or treatment causes an outcome like a reduction in COVID-19. Equipoise, or an ethical balance, is necessary to start and to continue a randomized clinical trial. So now I want to talk a bit about observational studies. And observational studies are when we don't control, but instead we just observe what's going on. So we're, we're looking at the data and we're measuring the data by just observing the general world in its current state. The grouping, therefore, is not assigned by us. So maybe I'm looking at who's COVID positive, COVID-19 positive or COVID-19 negative. Maybe I'm looking at who has fever and who doesn't, or people who go to college or people who don't go to college. And you know, quite often it's not ethical for me to do, for people to do an experimental study. I can't, it would be unethical for me to assign a certain group of people to go to college and another group of people not to go to college. So we can't always do an experimental study. We're quite fortunate that with treatments and vaccines and so on, we can. And that's very, very important. So with observational studies, causal conclusions are not possible, not in the same way they are for experimental studies. And I have an asterisk here because I do want to mention that there is a field of statistics called causal inference that uses advanced statistical techniques to provide more or less evidence of possible causality. But this isn't often applied in observational studies. So when you see an observational study in the news or a journal article, it almost certainly usually does not have causal inference applied. And when we're just looking at an observational study and just doing our typical basic statistical techniques such as correlation, we don't know the direction or even if there is a causal relationship at all. And part of the reason we don't know this is because we could have something called a confounding variable. A confounding variable is related to both of our variables that we're looking for a correlation between, and it can make a relationship appear or disappear. So an example of this might be if I want to look at the relationship between a person being put on a ventilator and survival. Does a person put on a ventilator have an increased chance of survival? Severity of COVID-19 could be a very clear confounder here because people who have a more severe COVID-19 illness are more likely to be put on a ventilator. And people who have a more severe COVID-19 illness are also less likely to survive. And so unless I'm very careful about the way I'm looking at my data and my study, I might conclude that people who are put on a ventilator are less likely to survive. That might not be true. It might just be confounded by the severity of COVID-19. Another example might be treatment and survival. So maybe I want to look at um, doctors prescribing hydroxychloroquine. But again, what if doctors are surviving are, are prescribing hydroxychloroquine in a non-random way to their subjects? What if doctors are, are prescribing hydroxychloroquine to subjects they think are more likely to survive? And you know, People do a lot of things without realizing they're doing it, right? And so it could be unconscious bias as well. And so if doctors were either consciously or unconsciously prescribing people to a, med a certain medication, if they thought those people had a better chance of survival because maybe they don't have enough medication for everyone, and we saw those people surviving more, we might, uh, the severity of COVID-19 would be a very clear confounder. So we have to be very careful about confounders. 
So here's kind of a silly example <clears throat> that I like to give when I'm talking about correlation is not the same as causation. And so on the x-axis here, I have year. And on the left y-axis, I have sales and millions of dollars of organic food. And on the right side y-axis, I have individuals diagnosed with autism. And we can see that these two curves track very, very closely. And we can see down here that a correlation metric we typically use is very close to one, indicating very high correlation between these two curves. <clears throat> But certainly that doesn't mean that the increase in organic food sales is causing an increase in individuals being diagnosed with autism, right? Autism, very serious. This is a silly example, though. But what about something not so obviously silly? What if we're looking at a graph or a plot that's not obviously causa not causation? <clears throat> so here, I have a very similar plot. I have year on the x-axis. On the left-hand y-axis, I have gas, lead, and tons per 1,000 people. And on the right-hand y-axis, I have violent crimes per 100,000 people. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the year for gas, lead, is about 23 years offset or before the violent crimes year. And that's to adjust for the exposure in childhood, and when violent crime peaks is usually when individuals are in their early 20s. And so if we look at these two curves, we might say, wow, they really overlay each other very closely. It looks like they're highly correlated. Does that mean from this figure, I can conclude that lead and gasoline or high exposure to lead causes an increase in violent crimes? Unfortunately, I cannot, but it's a really important question and important hypothesis. And so what do we do if we have a situation where um, we, we can't do an experimental study? I can't ethically give one group of children high exposure to lead and another group of children low exposure to lead. That would be unethical. But it's a really important question. So what do we do in that situation? Well, we can combine evidence. So we can use observational studies in children. Uh, we can use experimental studies in model organisms. So while it's not ethical for me to perform an experimental study in children, I can per perform an experimental study in mice where I give one group of mice high lead and another group low lead. I can also look for extremely bad outcomes. I can accumulate lots of evidence over time. And like I mentioned before, there are statistical and experimental methods that can add support to a causal relationship. In economics, one that's commonly used is called a pseudo-experimental study. And uh, we also have causal inference analysis, as I mentioned earlier. Again, experimental studies are my gold standard, and those are the ones that I can conclude a causal relationship. So now I want to go into four examples of generalizability and causal inference in the time of COVID. So, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Okay, so for example one, who do we want to test for COVID-19? So in the early days of COVID-19, quite often the only people tested were those who had a contact with with somebody who had a positive COVID-19 test and, ha and these people had certain symptoms, cough, fever, shortness of breath. Thus, prevalence of those symptoms in the early days were seen at a higher rate. Recently, at the end of April, the CDC added a whole bunch of new uh, symptoms, such as chills, muscle pain, headaches, and so on, and more recently, even fatigue and congestion and other symptoms were added. Now we can see who do we test for COVID play out in this um, article looking at the prevalence and clinical presentation of healthcare workers in Dutch hospitals. And if we look at the abstract and the results of this study, first we can see that um, 9,700 hospital workers were looked at and 13, about 1,300 of them reported fever or respiratory symptoms. And only those who reported fever or respiratory symptoms were tested. So not the 9,700, but only the 1,300 that had fever or respiratory symptoms. Now, of those 1,300, 86 healthcare workers um, had COVID-19. And of those 86 that had COVID-19, 
almost all of them, 93% of them had fever and or coughing and or shortness of breath. Now, I hope this comes to, of, to no surprise to anyone because we recruited based off of fever and respiratory symptoms. If I wanted um, an accurate estimate of the prevalence um, of fever and respiratory symptoms in just people in general with COVID-19, then I would need to have tested at all of these 9,700 people. And so if we look down here, we can see that we can generalize to hospital workers with a fever or respiratory symptoms. So if we come back to our, um, if we come back, sorry, I'm just gonna try to move this out of the way. If we come back to our general framework of statistics, we can see that we are sampling people who have a fever or a cough. And therefore, our sample contains people who have fever or cough. And therefore, we can generalize to the population of people who have a fever and a cough. My second example is an on high hydroxychloroquine. And so you might have heard many news articles and journal articles come out and there's that some of them um, contradict each other. And so I'm just showing two here. Uh, the one in the upper left said no clinical benefit from the use of hydroxychloroquine. And then these are the same article. Here's the news article that uh, mentions this journal article where it says treatment of with hydroxychloroquine in patients of COVID-19. And then the CNN news article says study finds hydroxychloroquine may have boosted survival, but there are doubts. And if we look a little bit more in depth into these two studies, we can see that this study down here was a retrospective observational study. What that means is that uh, we're looking at the data, it's observational, but we're looking retrospectively, back in time. So we look at people who were patients in a hospital, and then we looked at whether they received hydroxychloroquine. And the last sentence of this abstract, I think, is really telling. It says, prospective trials are needed to examine this impact. So even these, the authors of this journal article are stating that additional research is needed. Now, up here, uh, this study was a randomized clinical trial. And indeed, they ended the clinical trial early because the, they were out of equipoise. They did not find a clinical benefit. And then they decided that it was no longer ethical to continue to give patients hydroxychloroquine. So the third example I want to talk about is remdesivir. I don't know why I have trouble saying that one, remdesivir, as a potential treatment. So this recently came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. And if we look at the methods for this, we can see that this study was done on adults hospitalized with COVID-19, with the primary outcome was time to recovery or time necessary to leave the hospital. And so if we think about generalizability, we can generalize this to adults hospitalized with COVID-19, Additionally, we can see in the methods that this was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. Double-blind means that neither doctors nor patients know the treatment group that they're assigned to. Randomized means that the subjects were randomly assigned to the treatment group, either remdesivir or placebo. And placebo-controlled means that the subjects either receive the medication, remdesivir, or the placebo group. Now, here's a really, I think, informative plot. This is figure two from the paper. On the upper left-hand side, we can see the overall group, and we have days on the x-axis, and then proportion recovered on the y-axis. Remdesivir is in blue, and placebo is in red. And what we want to see here is we want to see the, the treatment um, people with remdesivir are going to recover faster. And what that looks like is the, the blue curve would be above the red curve that indicates a faster time to recovery. And so we have our overall sample up here. And then the authors broke this down by severities of patients. And we start with less severe up here, and then we go all the way to more severe down here. So less severe are patients not receiving oxygen, then patients receiving oxygen, patients receiving high flow oxygen, but non-invasive ventilation, and then patients receiving um, invasive ventilation. And so we can see that 
if we look at the most severe patients, we no longer really see um, a strong distinction with remdesivir above the placebo group. But we do see that separation with these subjects that um, are less severe. And so this is just an interesting breakdown that I think the authors did. And so the last example that I want to talk with you guys about is a vaccine. And so uh, clinical trials, again, randomized clinical trials, we're typically going to use randomized experimental placebo control trials with a vaccine. And so volunteers will randomly receive a vaccine or a placebo. And I just want to talk with you about the three phases of a, of a clinical trial and what is likely going on right now with all these vaccine trials so that you're, uh, you understand the terminology a little bit more. So in clinical trials, there are three main phases before um, a treatment or a vaccine is typically released and approved by the FDA to the general public. Phase one, trials are very small and they assess safety and dosage in healthy volunteers. So they're answering the questions, is the vaccine safe? Does safety vary at different dosages? Phase two clinical trials are typically more moderately sized and they are going to start assessing the potential benefit and side effects. Does the vaccine elicit immune system response? Are there any severe side effects? If there is an immune system response and there's no severe side effects, then we go into phase three. Now phase three is typically what we think of when we're thinking of a large scale randomized clinical trial. And this is where we are assessing, it's very large, and we're assessing the benefit, effectiveness, and again, side effects of the vaccine. COVID-19 vaccine trials will be very large, likely always over around 10,000 volunteers and even more. Now, won't it take forever to conduct a trial on 10,000 people? We want to move quickly, right? I'd like a vaccine yesterday. I don't know about you. Um, and, and so people are thinking about, are there ways that we can move vaccine trials a little bit faster? And sometimes these are called human challenge studies. So what about a human challenge trial? A human challenge trial is when volunteers for a vaccine trial are injected with a virus. So we still randomly assign subjects to either receive the vaccine or receive a placebo, and then everybody in the trial is injected with the virus. Now the pro is that this is a much, much faster trial than waiting for volunteers to be exposed to COVID-19 on their own. But the con, is that there is a non-trivial risk of death and comorbidities, for instance, long, lasting lung damage. Now, because of that really big con, it's probably unethical to inject people with a virus, everybody with a virus. And so people have been debating about, well, can we do a human challenge trial and can we do this in only healthy and young adults who are less likely to die and have comorbidities? Now, I want to bring you back to the central framework of statistics. If we are only including young and healthy people in our study, and our sample only has them, and we can only generalize to young and healthy people about whether this vaccine works. But that's not what we want to do, right? We want to generalize this vaccine to everyone. We want to know whether it works on older people and sick people and people at a higher risk. And we're going, if we want to do that, we're going to either have to use other logical evidence or assumptions, or we're going to have to come back into and do another study on older and sick um, and, and people with pre-existing conditions and so on that are at higher risk. Um, and that's what I anticipate would happen is that if there was, and I don't know of any vaccine trials that are human challenge yet, if there was a human challenge trial, I anticipate um, that it would be done on the healthy and young people. And that after, if the vaccine was shown to be effective there, that it would then be done later on um, on everyone. And, and I should say when I, I don't know of a human challenge trial um, yet, I don't know of a phase three human challenge trial. There are some phase twos. So you may have heard that Moderna is um, starting a vaccine trial and that UC Health at the University of Colorado Hospital is going to enroll patients. So they're recruiting 1,000 patients at University of Colorado Hospital and 30,000 nationwide. 
uh, this vaccine trial will not be a human challenge. So in summary, I'll end with always ask, can you conclude causality? Experimental studies, remember, especially randomized experimental studies are really useful here. And then ask, to whom can I generalize? Stay safe, wear a mask. Thank you very much. That was great, Dr. Hendricks. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to move on to Dr. Lodwick. Okay. There you go. Um, let me, for some reason, I, I need to get my... Um, Um, file back up. Okay. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, a different type of modeling than statistical modeling, modeling. and this will be um, a modeling from a data-driven analysis and a, um, a model-driven analysis. So uh, this, this talk is um, done in conjunction with Professor Masood Asadi, and Professor Francis Newman with some help from uh, Dr. Massimo Boschema at uh, Samayan Research in Rome and Dr. Marina Mizokoshi at the Federal University of um, Goiás in Brazil. What I want to do is to take a look at the um, problem itself, um, state the problem from this, these particular point of views and take a look at two approaches. One is model driven, which is the susceptible infected recovery, which typically is what CDC uses in order to tell you that 14 days of quarantine is what we need. Um, if we have herd immunity, then we'll be okay. You know, those types of things or um, other factors such as uh, the number of um, people that get infected from a single um, coronavirus uh, person. So um, the one approach is this, um, what we call SIR model, and these are susceptible infected recovered, um, and these are differential equations, which I'll explain in just a bit. And I'm going to take a look at one simulation that we did for the COVID outbreak here in the United States. But I want to focus a little bit more on the weighted centroid method, which is a data-driven analysis. And in particular, I want to take a look at the application of this method to the USA and Brazil. So uh, the problem that I'm going to take a look at is that given data of COVID cases on various dates, determine for a particular date the places where the impetus of the spread is most accelerating. That is, from where, what geographical locations are the spread most effective in causing the spread of uh, disease as uh, reflected in the collected data. Um, where will it go next, for example? Um, from New York, will it go to Florida and Texas, for example? Or from China, will it go to Europe first and then New York? Or how is that, how is the spread going to be um, done over time? 
the other is more of the uh, model driven analysis and that is what is the likely number of infection and the time course of the disease that is how long will we have the coronavirus around for example given um, uh, given a small uh, number of days it's not so small it's like four or five months already uh, will it last another four or five months so these are the types of questions that I'm interested at this particular, uh, for this particular presentation. So um, a model-driven analysis um, is where we encode the model in the cause-effect, or what we understand the cause and effect of the system. In our case, is the coronavirus causing the COVID. Uh, coronavirus is the virus that causes COVID, the disease, and what we know, what we encode beforehand are the cause and effects. So uh, basically statistics has been done and we try to encode in mathematics the cause relationships uh, in mathematics and in the world, uh, one of which is uh, equality, the other is inequality, the other is belonging to, for example, a particular person belongs to the city of Denver. So the belonging to is a relationship. What we're going to look at are differential equations and um, these are equations that change in time and space. And I'll present that in just a bit. The data-driven analysis, which is what I want to con concentrate on, is that the model is elicited from the data relationships. So the data tells us the cause and relationship, the cause and effect relationship, which then uh, is depicted, as we will see in this particular case, with respect to how the disease spread in time and space. So as we know, and I'm going to um, pretty much skip this, um, we know that the disease chart of the first case was in China, first case in the U.S. was um, both in the state of Washington and in California, and the, the various states at which the pandemic in the United States was declared, um, basically for UCD. It was um, March 14th, or Friday, March 14th, uh, as I recall, or 13th, and then we had to come back on March 16th with online classes. So these things are accelerating, or the, the COVID is accelerating quite fast. And these are some of the initial um, sources of information about how they uh, occurred here in the United States. So we are going to take a look at both the differential equation or data, um, or the model-driven analysis, and then we're going to take a look at the data-driven analysis. Um, so our, um, our partners uh, at UCD Mathematics and Statistics uh, are Samayan Research Center in Italy. Uh, we've partnered with them for maybe 12 years. Um, uh, several years ago, the State Department of the United States and Italy de designated um, our Center for Computational Mathematical Biology and Semeyan Research Laboratories in Rome as collaborating partners. And we have done research over the last 10, 12 years. We've taken a look at various types of um, outbreaks, Ebola, Listeria in, in Colorado, uh, West Nile, among other things, dengue in Brazil and so on. Uh, so, Prior to uh, taking a look at the data-driven analysis, I want to take a look at um, 
what we call compartmental models, which are these uh, model-driven analysis. And so in that case, what we do is to um, divide the world up into compartments and then take a look at the relationships between the compartments. Um, so in our case, we're going to take a look at the compartment that we're going to call susceptible. Those of us that um, do not have the disease, the infected, those that have the coronavirus, and the removed, those that either die or recover. Okay, those are the three compartments, and we call that SIR, susceptible, infected, removed. Uh, clearly, that. Um, what I'm going to present is super simple, and, but I want to do that as an illustration of what is being done, for example, by the CDC and CDPHE, the Colorado uh, Health Department. So the model itself is um, susceptible uh, changes to infected. So susceptible people then get infected, the infected then are removed either by death or by recovery. I recommend for you um, the about 30 minute YouTube presentation on these types of models, which are very well done by a professor in Oxford. And um, what I'm going to do is to do um, a five minute presentation on what uh, took about uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes um, by uh, this person that presented on YouTube. So at any rate, um, the susceptible compartment is related to the infected compartment. And the way that, it's, that it is related is by a rate of change in susceptible. So the rate of change of the susceptibles are, is equal to minus beta times the population in the infected. So let me go back a little bit here. S is the number of people in the susceptible compartment. I is the number of people that are affected removed, R is the removed, the number of removed people um, in that particular compartment. So the rate of change at which the susceptible population changes is uh, proportional to the product of the number of people that are infected with the number of people that are susceptible. So for example, if I go to class uh, at UCD, an in-person class in UCD, that's my population. Within the class, there are perhaps a certain number of us that are infected um, and a certain number of us that are susceptible. The rate of change at which a susceptible person changes into an infected person and is removed from the susceptible population is hypothesized as being uh, directly proportional to the product. So think of um, predator prey. So if you have a mountain lion and you have deer, the number of mountain lion in a particular geographic region and the number of deer, the product of these two, times a kill ratio, how many times will a mountain lion actually succeed in removing or eating a deer? Okay, and that's the minus beta. So the minus is because we're going to change from susceptible. Um, the, re, uh, the removed is going to be the uh, direct proportion of the number of people that are infected. So of the number of people that are infected, a certain proportion of those, the rate of change at which 
the uh, removed is directly related to the number of infected. So let's say 20% or let's say 5% die and 20% recover from uh, the infected. So that's hypothesized again. So we are encoding in mathematics uh, an understanding or a presumed understanding of the relationship between infected and recovered or removed. And lastly, the infected is going to be increased by the same proportion that we have. So the rate of change of the infected is going to be the plus of the beta infected times uh, susceptible minus the ones that are removed from the infected to the recovered or those that have died. So there are a couple of these um, uh, constants. I want to skip a little bit over these. Uh, and concentrate on the what's called the basic reproductive number. Um, the basic reproductive number is a number that is used to tell how many, if I have the coronavirus, how many people will I infect on average over a given um, period of time? So in one day, for example, if I'm infected, and then again, I have to assume a certain population density. So for example, why is it that um, Colorado doesn't want um, more than 100 people to gather together? Uh, and that is to keep this R0 down. That is, one infected person will infect how many others okay for the usa this is 5.8 as of the beginning of the pandemic um, if this number is less than one then we want we are reducing the disease if it's greater than one then we the outbreak is increasing uh, to give you an idea, flu is something like 1.3 or 1.5 or something like that. For coronavirus, it's something like 5.8, at least at the beginning, with no measures like masks or social distancing, for example, or quarantine. When you have the quarantine, you drive this number down, and that's what happens. Here is an example of an uh, SIR model for the United States with uh, the 5.8 number of infections that one person has um, in the population. And these are the number of days that you have. And basically, what you want is that you want 100% of the people recovered. And here, you're susceptible. Your susceptibles are going to zero uh, with no measures. So this is the worst case scenario. And the peak of the infection is something like 50 days. So um, we were quarantined for two months. Where did they come up with the two months? Well, they looked at this curve, and you will see that the peak is going down more or less at 60, okay? And the herd um, immunity is when this curve goes up, um, uh, your, your recovered, generally speaking, have uh, antibodies to fight the vaccine. So this is a very um, um, simple model. And of course, uh, CDC doesn't use this, but it uses the ideas behind this and makes it much more complex and adds um, many more uh, compartments. Say, for example, wearing masks, limiting the number of people that can 
uh, congregate in a particular area and so on, okay? So uh, now I want to take a look at um, a data-driven analysis. And, and in particular, I want to take a look at TWC, which is a group of software that was developed in Rome at Samaean Research um, Center. And we've been uh, working with it um, and we've done research with the, um, with the system itself. So TWC, topological weighted um, analysis, uh, topological weighted centroid analysis, is a data-driven geographic dynamic model that consists of six sets of algorithms at this stage in the development. So we've helped in the, a little bit in the development in the analysis of the algorithms themselves. It's geographic because COVID in, uh, in the study itself occurs in space. It's dynamic because COVID spreads in time. And so basically we're looking at spread in time and space. So, <clears throat> the idea behind uh, TWC is best explained by analogy. So, um, suppose I have a number of uh, corona terrorists. So, I have groups of corona terrorists, and I want to minimize the number of groups, and I want to maximize uh, maximize the uh, spread of the um, virus itself. And I want to, in the following sense, I want to locate myself in a geographical region in such a way that I reproduce the, the collected data. So the collected data that I'm going to take a look at for the United States is in early March, okay? So what I'm going to take a look at are where are these coronavirus terrorist cells going to be located to do the damage that is exhibited by the March, early March 2020 in the US. And it will be April, I think it is, <coughs> excuse me, be April for uh, Brazil, okay? In other words, um, what I want to do is to, if the cases for March that I'm looking at, so from February to March, I'm looking at cases, <coughs> and I want the, I want the terrorists, the coronavirus terrorists to locate themselves in such a way that they cause the distribution of the uh, uh, COVID cases in, in uh, early March, okay? So I want to locate them before early March in order for them to do the damage that uh, they're going to do, okay? Another way of looking at it is that um, if you're a predator, so if you're this mountain lion, and you're going to be in a particular uh, area, um, and you have deer in that area, where would you locate your den? From where would you operate in such a way that tomorrow, where would you locate your den or uh, today in such a way that tomorrow you have the maximum probability of attaining um, a deer, okay? given the terrain, okay? So the mathematization of that idea is what we call statistical thermodynamics, optimization of free energy, entropy, because we want uh, to um, maximize organization of this uh, analysis. <clears throat> so there are various, um, points of view, and then I will, the, the slides will be available to you so that you can take a look at a variety of different ways of explaining the same thing. So 
Uh, let me take a look at the algorithms themselves. Um, and I will focus on three of the 18 different algorithms that we have um, for, um, for the early, um, in, in um, the United States, for the early March analysis. We call these TWC alpha, beta, gamma. So TWC alpha locates the coronavirus terrorists yesterday in order to, or yesterday or a couple of weeks before um, yesterday, um, in order to achieve the distribution of the disease today. So if we're looking at early March, where, were, where would the impetus for the disease coming from? Beta looks like, where will I locate myself today in order to predict tomorrow? And a gamma looks even farther ahead, okay? And recall that we're going to take a look at early March. Uh, we would need to update, and we are updating, we have updated these to more recent um, data itself that comes from Johns Hopkins, for example. So this is the, um, this is the analysis alpha, which says where would um, the coronavirus locate themselves to look at the distribution that was reported in early March. You will, of course, see uh, Washington and California. Uh, California, the location of California is actually, uh, the, the outbreaks are in San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles, as I recall. <clears throat> but the uh, analysis locates themselves right in the region of um, central to north California. And for Washington, uh, more or less all in the state of Washington and a little bit in Oregon. And then coming off to Idaho and so on, here's uh, Colorado. Um, and you will see that New York does not appear at this particular time. And I think New York began uh, mid to late March. Um, so this is an earlier um, map. So this is the, uh, where would you locate them yourself um, today in order to affect the change tomorrow? And um, tomorrow meaning mid-March. So you would locate yourself in California and in this particular region in order to affect the data that you see um, coming out of our collected data itself, okay? So this is spreading, okay? And you'll see the beginnings of the spread in the East Coast. And of course, nothing in uh, Florida or Texas or um, Arizona, okay? Because this, uh, the analysis or the data for Texas and, um, and even, um, uh, Georgia, Georgia, Texas, the Southeast hadn't begun already, hadn't begun yet. Okay. Professor and, Lodwick, we have about 10 minutes left and we'd like to leave some time for questions, okay? Okay, so um, this would be uh, what's going to happen uh, in the future, okay? And let me just take a look very quickly at Brazil. Um, these are the cases reported in Brazil, the frequency of the cases in Brazil. And um, this is the um, actual data from Brazil. And this is uh, March 17. And this is where you would locate yourself in order to look at that particular distribution that you have. So the impetus of the disease is actually um, more or less in the center of the country. And this is 
uh, how you would predict a spread of the disease tomorrow. And this would be a couple of days. And it corresponds fairly well to what's happening. Um, and there is also a um, graph network that you can actually perform. And we performed this in the United States itself. And this will tell you how the disease is being spread. And in particular, both of these correspond to truck routes and air routes, except for here, this is the Amazon River, and this is the Amazon um, uh, travel by boat, and it's bearing out to be the case. So let me skip back and uh, tell you that at the end of my slides, you will see some resources, um, both web, and this is what we've done with our partners in Rome. And these are general um, uh, studies that have been done with respect to the uh, modeling of COVID. And I would, urge everyone to take a look at um, the, uh, let me see where I have it, this, the, the YouTube uh, video on the model-driven analysis. So um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, could we have your co-researchers and Audrey Hendricks please come back live with us for questions? Maybe you could unshare your PowerPoint. Ah, yes. Uh, let me see if I can get back. Ah. Thanks. We're a little strapped for time, so I think I'm just going to ask our first question here um, for Professor Hendricks. Um, in statistics, how often is data manipulated to prove a specific point or hypothesis? How do we know that bias is minimized in our data studies? So it's a great question, and, and I know it's a concern of a lot of people, right? Um, you know, there's all those famous quotes, right? Liars, Dan liars and statisticians. Um, I would say that from my experience, quite often it's um, not a blatant people trying to miss and actually do things they shouldn't with statistics. Usually it's people um, not quite understanding exactly how they should be displaying and presenting the statistics and not giving all of the information that they should. And so as consumers in the news and journal articles and so on and so on, I encourage you to look for and make sure all the information that you would expect to be there is there. Was the study experimental or observational? What type of people, how did they decide to recruit their people? Did they remove anybody due to any reasons? All of that information should be there. Sometimes it's not in news articles, and if it's not, then I encourage you to try to link back to the journal article. Almost all of the COVID journal articles are open access. The um, Most of them are, at least. And, uh, and and look for all that information because it should be there. And that's how you can help ensure that the data is being analyzed and then interpreted correctly. Great, thank you. Um, and another one, can you talk about the recent claims that blood type may be an indicator of how severe a person's case of COVID will be? Are those studies just statistically sound? It's a great question. Um, I have heard about those in passing, but like you, I'm sure I haven't, I haven't been able to keep up with those. So I'll just say, I don't know yet, but I'll go and check it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I have one for Professor Lodwick. Um, let me try to figure this out. Does the TWC model 
provide insights into upcoming hotspots worldwide? Um, yes, if, we, if uh, we haven't done a worldwide model itself, we've just focused on various regions. But um, yes, um, for hot, uh, coming up hotspots in the United States or Brazil, uh, uh, this has been taken a look at uh, in Italy, actually. So our colleagues in Italy have applied it to Italy and then where the emerging, emerging hotspots are going to be. And perhaps uh, Professor uh, Masood uh, Asadi might jump in here too. Basically, we use a model, we call this one modified version of TWC. We call this one TWC windowing. That means we are going to almost like look at different, mm -hmm. use the TWC first in different region. Let's say that, but it's more than that. But you might, we could maybe expand that from over the world and then put those, and then we could overlap all of those things together. Okay, so that works. Yes. So TW is even doing much more for this one. Yes. Yeah. To answer the question, we have not done it for the world. We've just done it for Iran, for Italy, for United States, Brazil, and now we're taking a look at Chile. Right. So there's no way to kind of see yet where, from your well, model, like where things are going to happen. Oh, yes, we could do that. Uh, we haven't done it. We haven't right. done it from uh, assuming that we have world information, which in a lot of cases we do. Um, and uh, that could be done on the level of the world. That would, I don't know, we would have to take a look and see whether or not uh, the computer systems that we would have would be able to um, uh, manage that, um, that information. Right. Okay, great, thank you. And, and a final question for Dr. Hendricks. Um, can stats help us figure out why the age of people with COVID has been changing over the months? Oh, sure, absolutely. Great question. So, um, you know, one of the reasons that we see people um, being infected at lower ages is because we're actually looking at them now. We're actually testing in that group. So before we were only testing in people um, who were exposed to the disease and I should have added probably at high risk. And so quite often we would um, say, well, we know you have a cough and a fever, but you're not of high risk. We're not going to test you. Whereas if it was an outbreak in a um, assistant living community with elderly or people at high risk, we were testing at a much higher frequency. And so that's where we were seeing COVID quite a lot. Um, now we are seeing COVID much more often in um, people who are younger and including in children. Now we don't yet know what the prevalence and how often um, COVID is transmitted um, in children and in, in younger groups, but we are seeing an increase in part because we're testing there more. And then there's other theories too, right? That that maybe um, people who are younger are are not as socially distant as, you know, people who are older. So there's multiple things going on. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, now I have, I have a final question for both of you. I know we're going to wrap up <laughs> over, um, but uh, somebody's dog I'm, is, is answering the question now. Um, where do both presenters view the intersection of the two disciplines? Um, E.g. address bias in model formulation with statistical approaches, um, uncertainty quantification, or how best can statistical inference inform and improve the development of models? So I think there's probably less of a distinction between, I'll, I, I'll be interested to hear what Weldon has to say, but I think uh, there's a huge overlap in statistics and mathematics, right? Um, if we are sampling from a population and doing math and making an inference back to a larger population, then we're using a lot of the statistics principles. But under the hood of every good statistics analysis is a lot of mathematics. And so, you know, they, they overlap quite a bit. Um, I, I think I only answered part of your question, but maybe I'll let Weldon chime in too. Uh, well, 
Uh, there are, are several cases or several places where statistics comes in. First of all is in estimating the uh, parameters of the differential equation model that is purely a statistical process. Um, the other place comes in in TWC since it's a statistical thermodynamic systems that uh, undergirds the, um, the res um, the way I take a look at it is that um, TWC is an architecture. Um, it's it's a framework, and then the the, the data uh, then generates the model itself um, without assumptions. The only assumption that is used in it is that um, how do you how do you receive the data? So there's a structure in which you receive the data. And um, when we use statistical thermodynamics for the underlying theory of, um, of, of the spread and uh, location of the spread, then uh, we do use uh, statistical uh, thermodynamics in particular. All right. Well, thank you both and your your team as well for for coming today and participating in this lecture series. We have our final uh, lecture on next Monday will be Dr. Jennifer Reich talking about vaccines um, and anti-vaccine people as well. So it's a, going to be a good way to wrap up this series. Thank you again, and we'll see you next week.